Oh, so you wanna run Jenkins, huh? I don't blame you, it's badass. So I'm gonna show you three different ways to do that. The first one, running as a server, and then I'll tell you why you never wanna do that. Then I'll show you how to run it as a Docker container directly, and we'll talk about um, making Jenkins upgrades easy by doing that. And then the third way, we're gonna launch Jenkins on Kubernetes, and that's gonna give us, oops, <laughs> That's going to give us the opportunity to talk about some interesting things like Kubernetes and how Kubernetes applications run. And we're also going to be using Helm to deploy that. So we'll get to talk about Helm too. So let's jump into it. I am going to try and do this just on the fly so that you see all the mistakes I make and you learn from them. I mentioned there's three ways to run Docker. Okay, the first one, actually we don't even need a screen cap for that because you can run Docker it's a Java application, so you can run it in a Tomcat server or a Jetty server. I just really don't recommend doing that, even if you have like a dedicated physical or virtual machine set aside for Jenkins. Um, there's just a lot of maintenance and upkeep and work to get Jenkins running in that, and odds are you don't have any other Tomcat or Jetty applications in your environment so it's a skill set that you would have to pursue that just doesn't really provide a lot of value because way number two to run Jenkins is as a Docker image. And so if we jump over to the screen here, you'll see exactly what I mean. So Docker, um, Jenkins just actually makes the Docker image for you, right? There's a Docker image. Yes, Jenkins slash Jenkins is the image. Let's switch over to our terminal here and we can actually run Jenkins just like this, just with a Docker command. So let's look at the command. So we've got, got our Docker command, obviously run, makes sense, right? Name, we're gonna give it the name Jenkins and then we're gonna detach it so that it runs in the background. Now we need to publish a couple ports. So we're gonna publish port 8080 inside the container to port 8080 on my workstation. We also need to publish port 50,000, which is used by Jenkins. And then we're gonna mount a volume. We're gonna mount the Jenkins data folder in this directory as var Jenkins home, right? This way, that's where Jenkins writes all of its stuff to, so that will get saved outside of our Docker container, which gives us the ability to do easy upgrades because we're gonna run the container Jenkins slash Jenkins with the tag LTS, and that LTS stands for long-term support. Now, this is like the Jenkins stable image, and so it's been tested, it's been vetted, it's usually really, really reliable, and doing it this way makes Jenkins upgrades super, super, super easy because all you have to do whenever you're ready to do the upgrade is pull down the latest LTS image, restart your Docker container, and boom, you are magically upgraded. So let's fire that up, and it's running in the background, supposedly. Let's test that. And there it is. So we'll switch over here. We expose port 8080. So if that works, there we go. Jenkins is getting ready to work, which means I don't have to. All right, so now we're in the setup wizard here. And um, let's, let me show you this real quick. There's a password that was written to this file. So if we copy that, we can use our docker exec command with an interactive terminal on our Jenkins container and run bash inside of that. And then we can do a cat of that file and get our password. Pop that in here. No, we don't need one password, not for that. And that's gonna take us into our setup wizard. So that was pretty easy, right? I mean, technically Jenkins is up and running right now. I mean, we could run with this. So if you have, if you don't have a Kubernetes environment, which we're gonna do next, um, but you do have a virtual machine or a physical machine to run Jenkins on there, this is the way to do it. Then you're just running Jenkins as a Docker container on that machine. 
upgrades are done just by pulling that latest LTS image, like I mentioned, and then all of your data is written to uh, the mounted volume that we mounted with our Docker command. And you don't even have to remember that command because on the Jenkins documentation, they have an entire section on Docker that walks you through all of that. So that's out of the way. Now it's on to configuring Jenkins. Or if you wanna run this on Kubernetes like I do, that's where we're heading next. All right, so let's talk about this installation on Kubernetes for a minute. So we're gonna run Jenkins on Kubernetes. So we know that we're gonna need a Jenkins container. And in Kubernetes, if we're running a container, it needs to be inside a pod, right? And then we've got, Jenkins is gonna have all this data that it's creating and saving. And we need to save that because we want that to persist across crashes and restarts over the course of the next number of years. So we need um, a place to store that, a storage location, and that's gonna come in the form of a persistent volume. And so for a pod and a container to connect to a persistent volume, we need a persistent volume claim. And then in order to get the most use out of this, we're gonna need a way to get to Jenkins, right? It's a browser-based application. So we're gonna to have to have an exposed port and then we don't know where that's gonna be running in, in Kubernetes. So we need a load balancer or a, um, an exposed service in order to connect to that. And so that's a lot of components, right? Now we could create all of those components individually and manage that ourselves but there's a better way. That's where Helm comes into play. All right, so let's look at the screen here. And I've got the Jenkins Helm chart open. It's, uh, it's a GitHub repo that anyone can access. And just to be honest, normally I use Bitnami Helm charts. Like if there's a Bitnami Helm chart available, I almost always use it, even over the ones provided by the people who wrote the software themselves, just because Bitnami Helm charts are the bomb. Um, but we're gonna go with the Jenkins chart here. I haven't used either one of those for the record, so we'll go this way and give Jenkins a shot. So the first thing we gotta do is we have to install the Helm repo on our Kubernetes cluster. Um, all right, let's see, Kube control config, current context. I wanna make sure I'm connected to the right cluster here. I am. So we'll do a Helm repo, just running that. Well, that was pretty special, wasn't it? It's been added. And then we'll do a Helm repo update. So that's grabbing the latest chart. And you can see all the other Helm charts I have installed here, but here's the one we're concerned with. It grabbed the Jenkins chart. All right, and so now to install it, we can just use helm install, give it a release name, which is the name that we want to see it referred to as in our Kubernetes environment, and then specify Jenkins slash Jenkins, which what that's telling us here is within helm, look for a repo called Jenkins, and within that repo, look for a chart named Jenkins. So it's a little, um, a little confusing, but that's how it works. Right? But we're not gonna do that right away because we want to customize this. And that's what I really wanna get into here. Um, we could read the readme. We'll probably regret not reading it, but that's how we're doing this. In every Helm repo, you'll find a file called values.yaml. And these are all of the knobs and switches that you can twist and turn and flip for this Helm chart to configure your installation, all right? So let's go through some of these. Here's what I normally do. I look through here and just look for the ones that are of interest to me, right? Now, some there's two ways you can do this. You can either take this whole um, YAML file and use it as your values with the defaults and everything else because all of these specify safe defaults and you only override the ones you're interested in. Um, I tend not to do that. I just grab the ones that I'm changing, which makes it easier for someone who comes along behind me to see what's actually different, right? Because there's, um, scroll, scroll, scroll. There's 877 lines in this. So someone who comes along after me 
they're gonna um, look at that. If I were to copy this whole thing, they would look at it and not really be certain which values I've overridden from the defaults without doing a deep comparison here. So I'm looking out for the future person, which is probably me. So future Will is gonna appreciate that I did it this way. All right, so we've got a controller here, um, pulling the Jenkins image. Um, don't wanna change that. Not interested in host networking. The admin user. Password defaults to random. I'm okay with that. Jenkins home, I like that because that's the standard for Jenkins. I don't really want to change a, something that's traditional and standardized unless I have to. Um, resources starts off with 50 micro CPUs and 256 meg of RAM. And that's what it requests. And then it will obviously use more as it needs it up to 2000 micro CPUs and four gig of RAM. For what I'm gonna do with this one, that's probably fine, but if you're running a larger Jenkins installation, you're gonna to want to adjust that. Run as user 1000, I'm fine with a user 1000, but that's really important because that's telling us that the, the um, Docker container here is not running as root, which is super important and super impressive. Can I work the word super in here again? It's super cool. It's just the sign of a really well thought out Helm chart when you see them doing this, right? It gives me confidence that we're, um, we're picking a good chart here. The service port 8080, we saw that already. That's the default Jenkins port. The health probes, this is how Kubernetes is going to know that the container's up and running. Agent listener port for our Jenkins agent, port 50,000. So it looks like here we could specify a CIDR range of values that are allowed to access it. Kind of interesting, not interested in pursuing that at the moment though. Um, additional plugins, additional secrets, cloud name. Now, okay, the JCASC, um, Jenkins configuration as code, over the last couple of years, they have made huge progress in this that um, allows you to configure Jenkins, well, as code, as implied by the name. Trust me, I, I really can do more than just point out the obvious here. It's just sometimes it takes me a little bit to get there. So Jenkins configuration is code. Like, let's say you want your Jenkins authentication to be governed by your Active Directory or your LDAP server. Well, you can specify that in here. So whenever you boot this Jenkins server up, it's already configured, configured for that. And the thing that you're avoiding doing there is booting up a Jenkins server and then typing and clicking a bunch of stuff in the web GUI and then that information is lost, right? It'll still be, it'll still be saved to your Jenkins directory, but like the exact things that you changed is lost. And the reason that becomes important is because um, if someone has to troubleshoot that, probably future you, then you may not remember the exact things that you clicked on or the order that you clicked on or the values that you typed in. So by, by doing configuration as code, then you've documented what it was you're doing. Hopefully you're keeping this value file in a Git repo. And then as you make changes to it over the coming years, you'll have that entire Git history to see what was changed and when and use that as a reference. Cool story, bro. Sidecars. Um, I don't think we're interested in any sidecars at the moment. For reference though, a sidecar in a Kubernetes pod, we can have multiple containers, right? So you've got your main container and then you can have sidecar containers, which often are used for like um, 
like, uh, how do I want to say this? Like auxiliary services. A good example is if you have um, a container that needs uh, access to a certain folder, you can use a sidecar that boots up before that main container and goes out and changes the file permissions on that directory structure so that when your main container comes up, all the permissions are correct for it. That's kind of a really rough example of it. Oh, another good example. Here's a real legitimate example. If you're using um, HashiCorp Vault, Vault will run as a sidecar. And so before your main container boots up, uh, that sidecar will go out to your Vault grab the secrets that are relevant for that container and then mount them as a read-only directory that gets shared between the sidecar and your main container. So when your application boots up, it you tell it that there's a specific file path where you're gonna find all the secrets you ever wanted to know about. All right, our ingress. This is probably where we're gonna to want to change some stuff. Oh yeah, enabled faults. Well, let's just change that. Uh, so we're going to do them values.yaml. And so the way this works is we're just going to change the values that we're interested in, but they're all, it's a YAML file, right? So everything is like nested. So ingress is the root level that we're going to change. And then we want to set enabled to true. And then annotations. Um, if you haven't worked with ingress before, so an ingress is something that gets handled by, it's a, an ingress route, a route into Kubernetes that gets handled by uh, your load balancer. So in my specific application here, I've got a Kubernetes system running back there on virtual machines, and I use the Metal LB load balancer. And so I'll run the Nginx ingress controller. And so that controller will get a, a, uh, an IP address from my cluster that's accessible to the rest of my network here, right? And so the ingress controller is going to uh, um, say, hey, when you receive traffic on this IP address, route it over to this Kubernetes service where this Kubernetes service is going to be Jenkins. Now there's a bunch of different ingress classes that you can use. There's the Nginx ingress controller. There's the traffic uh, ingress controller. Um, okay, when I said a bunch, maybe there's not a bunch. Those are the only two I know of, but there's probably a couple more, but either way. So we need to set our annotations to tell it that I'm using the Nginx controller. And so that goes on here because spacing is important. And then we want to give it a host name. Does that go on the same line? It does. So we're going to give it Jenkins.w8n.io which is my domain. And TLS would be where you specify the SSL certs or the TLS certs for exposing this under SSL. I don't have any configured on this cluster right at the moment, so we're gonna skip that. And don't care about host aliases. And so here's Prometheus. I think I want the Prometheus metrics. I think I want some metrics. So let's do this. Is that right? Enable true. Scrape interval. Sure, all that's cool. HTTP key store. That looks great. Our agent enabled is true. I don't know that we want to change any of that just yet. I'm probably wrong, but at the moment, we're gonna stick with that story. Here's the other thing I was specifically looking for, persistence. So now, persistence meaning, hey dude, 
where do you want me to write your shit to, right? So enabled is true. Um, and there's a couple of options here. We can give it an existing PVC claim and create that claim manually ahead of time. We can give it an, a storage class. The main difference between the two is like where you're running, right? So I'm running on my Kubernetes environment back here. I've got uh, NFS running on my SAN, but that's gonna lead me towards creating my PVC manually, which we'll get into. Um, but if you're using something like AWS or GKE or AKS for Azure or any of the other providers that has dynamic provisioning, that's where your storage class would come into play. So you would just specify a storage class that's available through one of those providers. Let's say if you're on AWS and you're using Elastic Block Store, then you would specify that storage class. And whenever this comes up and comes to life, it will just go grab a new dynamically provisioned uh, file volume storage from that provider. But I don't have that on my network, so we're gonna go with the manual route. So that means we need to set our persistence enabled true. Is that right? That didn't feel right. Yeah, that's right. And then existing claim, we'll call it Jenkins PVC. So now that doesn't exist, we'll get to creating that. Network policy, not sure I'm interested in that. RBAC, create true. That's always a good sign to see. That always makes me happy to see that in the background, in the charts here, they're creating the role-based access controls to make sure that this only has access to what it needs access to. Um, backups, Pfft. don't need backups. Backups are for the weak. Just kidding, we should have backups, but I wanna see this up and running and then we'll iterate on it to improve it, right? Cool story, bro. All right, so that looks like all we're gonna change. And so now that's really highlights what I was telling you earlier here. This is, um, you know, just a few lines here, what, 12 lines or so of things that we've changed versus the 877 lines of things that were available to change. So now this is something you can look at and you're like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing here. So let's write that out. And um, what do we wanna do next? So we know we need to create our persistent volume and persistent volume claim. I think I wanna bring this up first though, knowing that it's gonna come up in a pending state because that'll give us the opportunity to, to just poke around and look and learn a few things. So um, let's go back to our main repo readme. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. Helm install release name Jenkins slash Jenkins. So we're gonna do Helm install and we'll just call it Jenkins. And then we'll type Jenkins again, and then we'll type Jenkins again. So you know, the one thing I didn't notice in here was a namespace, um, which, seems to be common among Helm charts. So you don't really specify your namespace in there, but I don't want this running in the default namespace. I like everything in its own namespace. So we will give it, is it dash in? I think it's dash in. I might have to do dash dash namespace, but it does give us the opportunity to type the word Jenkins again, cause that's fun. All right, let's see how many of these values we got right. It's like a game show. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, create namespace Jenkins not found. Right. kubectl create namespace Jenkins. All right. Round two, lightning round. That's assuming that lightning is really slow and awkward. Oh shit, it worked. 
I mean, yeah, it worked. I knew it was going to. All right, so remember we did not specify an admin password, and there's a really good reason for that because we're gonna commit this file to a repository, and we never wanna submit or commit our passwords to a repo. We just don't. But we do need that password if we're gonna log in, and they have conveniently provided a command here that we can run to get the password. Let's see if it works. Oh, no, it's not, because our container doesn't come up. Right, I knew that. Um, so let's do K9S. So we could type out all these Kubernetes commands to show you what I need to show you here, or we can just use K9S, because it's much, much nicer. Our Jenkins container is in a pending state, and so if I hit the D command on here, we can go all the way down here to the bottom, and we can see that we have unbound persistent volume claims, which is what we were expecting to see, right? Because um, like I mentioned, we specified the persistent volume claim in our Helm chart, but we haven't created that yet. So let's jump over here. We've got our values file, let's clear that. And let's do a storage.yaml file. So we're gonna create our storage here and the first thing we specify is our API version which is used by Kubernetes to determine the different things that are available to you. The kind of thing that we're creating here is we're gonna create first a persistent volume and give it a little metadata, which just makes it nice to know things. So like a name, we're gonna call this our Jenkins PV, PV meaning persistent volume. And then we're gonna apply a label, and that label is gonna be app.kubernetes.io slash managed by, and specify hand. So that seems really awkward, right? But it's actually a common thing to do. So later, when we're looking at this, we'll have this label applied and we can say, oh, look, here's a managed by label set to hand, meaning somebody built this manually versus one that was like dynamically provisioned by some service um, or provider or something like that. So the next thing we wanna do is we actually start building out our spec itself here. We need to give it a storage class name and you'll see where this comes into play in just a minute. We'll give it the name of Jenkins Storage. Our capacity will specify as storage of eight GI, which is gigabytes. And then an access mode, plural because that's an array. We give it read, write, once. And so there's different options you can do here. You can do read write once, meaning that only one claim can access this at a time. There's read write many, meaning multiple things can be accessing it. And then uh, read only, I think there's a read only once, but I don't think there's a read only many. I could be wrong on that though. Our persistent volume reclaim policy is going to be set to retain. The other option there is delete. And then NFS is, so NFS here is where we're actually specifying like the place that you're going to write to. I'm using NFS. This could be um, a local path. It could be a host path. It could be a cloud provider storage like Amazon EBS or something like that. Um, the path is going to be the path on my NFS server, which is volume one, services, Jenkins data. And then the NFS server itself is 192.168.30.233 because I don't have my DNS set up yet. All right, so that's our persistent volume. That's, you know, 
as you can tell by specifying the NFS parameters, that's where this data is going to live in my network. The next thing we need is our persistent volume claim, which is going to be like the, um, the person saying, hey, that's my volume. Get your damn hands off. So again, we specify our API version of V1, and then our kind this time is going to be a persistent volume claim. Man, it's so hard to spell while talking. Metadata. <laughs> we'll give this a name of Jenkins PVC. And so now this has to match up with the persistent volume claim value that we specified over in our Helm values file. And we also should specify here a namespace of Jenkins because Persistent volumes are not namespaced. Those are available across the entire cluster. Persistent volume claims, however, are namespaced, meaning that only things within the same namespace can access them. So if you remember a couple minutes ago when we deployed Jenkins, we deployed it into its own namespace in order for that installation to be able to grab this persistent volume claim, they both have to be in the same namespace. Then moving on to our spec, we've got a storage class name. And if you're paying attention, you're gonna notice that that matches up with our storage class name up here. This is the start of a couple of sequences here that allow this persistent volume claim to claim the persistent volume we've specified above. So the storage class name has to match. The access modes have to match up. So we got to make this read write once. And then we're going to do some resources here. Specifying our request. And in our request, we want to specify, we want to request a storage of eight gigabytes, which again is going to match up to the capacity of our persistent volume. All right, I think that's going to work. Probably not, but we'll find out. So we'll do a Q control apply dash F, where dash F means file, and the file we want it to apply is storage.yaml. Boom! Big ol' error. Dun, dun, dun. Unknown field access modes, unknown field capacity. Unknown field NFS. I blew this all up. This is a nice little statement here. Um, if you choose to ignore these errors, just turn off validation. I'm sure that'll work out fine. All right, so check this out. Um, and my YAML file, it's all fucked up. So our, we've got our spec right here, <clears throat> our capacity is actually a subset of that. So just gotta indent this stuff. Same thing with our persistent volume, oops, reclaim policy, NFS. And blah, 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 blah. Um, I think that part looks right, though. But you know what? There's a way to find out. Unknown field resources in the persistent volume claim. Oh, and an invalid um, value on our path must be an absolute path. Gotcha. All right, I know what it's looking for. That's part of our spec two. And then the other thing it was bitching about is it wants an absolute path like that. Or does it? Ooh, let's see. Hey, created. All right, so now we're over Back over in K9S, let's take a look at the PVs. There is our persistent volume created. 
Notice here that it says bound, meaning that our Jenkins PVC claim successfully picked it up. So if we go back over to our pods now, we're still set to pending, but um, let's take a look at this. Here's something interesting. Um, let me go through here. I'll walk you through this. So we've got our, our container here, and we're talking about the Jenkins container specifically. Inside of that, we've got some mounts specified. Now, a lot of these are just Kubernetes-specific things. The one that we are concerned about is var Jenkins home, because that's where Jenkins writes its data, and that's coming from Jenkins home. So if we go down here to our volumes, we're going to see one named Jenkins home right here, Jenkins home. That's coming from a persistent volume claim, all right? And here's the interesting thing. The claim name is Jenkins. But if we look over here, we specified an existing claim of Jenkins PVC. And if we check the documentation, it says to use an existing persistent volume claim Install a chart setting persistence.existing claim to PVC name. Maybe that's where we went wrong. So let's do this. Let's get um, let's get out of here. Let's change the name of our persistent volume claim to Jenkins. Doink, doink, doink. Write that. Cube control apply dash f storage.yaml. Oh, did not like that. Warning persistent volume claim Jenkins is missing last applied configuration annotation, which is required. Persistent volume claim Jenkins is invalid. Spec is, oh, here's why. Spec is immutable after, after creation. Duh, that makes sense. So let's do this. Cube control um, delete dash F. And that's going to delete everything that we specified in that file, which is okay because we never actually brought anything up on it to begin with. Okay, so I deleted that and then did the old apply thing again after changing changing the PVC name, it created them. And now you can see our Jenkins container is on its way up with an error. That's wonderful. Let's try the logs. Oh, permission denied. That makes sense. All right, so that's a permission error on my NFS. This user 1000 does not have permissions to write on that. So let me go change that real quick. All right, so those permissions are changed. We've got the container on its way up. If we hit L for logs, it looks like it's coming up. So now let's go take a look over at our ingress. I was really expecting to see one there, but I don't. We've got Jenkins running on a cluster IP. Why is that running on a cluster IP? I thought we told it to run as a service. Oh, let's see. Yeah, I was really hoping this would be like a 20 minute video. I think we passed that a long time ago. So if you're still watching, hey, thanks man. I hope this is valuable for you. Ah, controller ingress. You see what we did wrong there? You see what we did wrong there? We got it at the top level. Let's do controller ingress. And 
rotation, so let's make sure it looks the same. Uh, controller. Why did they specify the API version? So ingress, and then under it is enabled hostname annotations. Enabled hostname annotations. I don't think we need the API version. But let's go take a look at our values.file. Ingress, ingress, ingress. Yeah, so that's specified as a default, so we don't need to specify that again. So let's try that, and now you get to see a Helm upgrade. So we're gonna do Helm upgrade. The release name, which is the name that we gave it, is Jenkins. Our chart is Jenkins slash Jenkins. The namespace is Jenkins. And then the file containing our values is dash F values.file. All right, so there's that. Don't care about that. Let's go back over to our pod. Crash loop back off. The f dude? Unknown host, updates.jenkins.io. So just in case you didn't pick that out of what I was looking at there, I was looking at this. Unknown host exception, updates.jenkins.io. Let's do this. Um, Yeah, so that's definitely a valid site, which is unfortunate. All right, so unfortunately, I've got something going on in the network in my Kubernetes cluster, but um, I will show you this. Fixing up the ingress did correct the fact that we didn't have an ingress. So now we have an ingress in our Jenkins namespace and it's bound to star, which means all hosts on port 80, which is what we were expecting. So now I'm actually gonna stop the video right here because I'm well over an hour, and if you're actually still watching, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, now, the part that's really bothering me about this is this is the micro Kates cluster I just installed in the video that probably led you here. So I'm gonna dig into it further. I have a very, very high degree of confidence that we have Jenkins configured correctly. And if it weren't for a network issue in my Kubernetes cluster, it would come up and be running. Um, I'm gonna go dig into that network issue. And if it turns out that that's not the case, um, I will let you know in the comments down below and also, if it turns out that there's something going on with MicroKates causing this network issue, either something in MicroKates itself or something in how I showed you how to configure it in that other video, I will update you on that as well. So as always, thanks for watching and I'll see y'all in the next video.